Hey yo, what is up knights? Aegis Rick here, and I'm extremely excited and relieved to announce that this is the final of all of the Otherverse dungeons. I did not expect this little project of mine to be so time and soul consuming, but luckily so, this dungeon is not that. It's a much more standard dungeon, but there are still some things that you should know, namely what it is that you cannot do. Do note that we have cube reactions again, and I've added a new icon I've deemed knockdown reactions, which mostly only occur in this dungeon. We'll talk about that once we get there. Now in terms of items, I've got no real recommendations aside from HP potions. Like I said, this is a pretty straightforward Otherverse dungeon. But if you're all set, let's embark on our last Otherverse journey. Room 1, and I think we've all learned by now what to expect in the first room of these OV dungeons. Regular ass mobs. The dragons in the back can cast a flamethrower breath that covers half of the map. Dispatch the room quickly and let's deal with the first mini boss. Warning. Do not use cubes in this room, aside from a very specific strategy that we'll talk about in a second. Now, room 2 features one of the most restrictive mini-bosses I can think of. He has a skill he casts in reaction to a party member using a cube skill that will grant him an invincibility shield that will burst after a set amount of hits. You keep using cube skills, and he'll just keep casting this shield, so avoid doing that. But on top of this, this boss also has a new kind of reaction that responds to knockdown. Knocking this boss down will grant him invincibility frames for about a second. That is, you aren't able to hit him while he's knocked down and even a short while after he gets back up. So avoid using knockdown skills. Lastly, this boss also has a reaction to being knocked up. Damn man, what the hell? If he's in a juggle state, he will immediately transform into a dragon and fly into the sky, dropping random debris on party members. All this to say, just keep him standing on his feet, all right? The only attack you really gotta avoid is this very obscure tail slam. It causes knockdown to the entire room, and you actually want this to happen, because afterwards he's going to roar for a very long time, doing ample damage to those who didn't use their quick rebound skill to avoid the entire attack. For this reason, you might want to turn off your super armor for this room, otherwise you're just going to have to tank the damage. Now, okay, there is one very potent strategy to beating this guy, however, and if you do it, you can pretty much disregard everything I've already said. For a split second after loading into the room, it is indeed possible to use cube skills without fear of retaliation. You can go in there and use a good super hold grab like Ground Quaker or CC like Junk Spin, which are often cube skills. While the boss is in CC, you can pretty much do anything you want. Use cube skills, whatever, and it's in this short amount of time that you want to try to kill the boss. The second that CC runs out, however, it's back to the normal boss fight. Maybe before entering room 2, you coordinate amongst your party members who can either use a skill or an assist to get that done. Room 3 has but a single dangerous gimmick that will occur right when loading into the room. And because of the nature of this gimmick, do not rush and attack this boss. Just wait for it to happen first. The boss will choose a party member at random to become their slave, and then summon two stalkers on the ground. You'll know if you're a slave if you have a large red orb possessing your body. It's up to the slave to then kill the stalkers, but you've got to do it without hitting the boss himself. If the slave hits the boss, it will reflect any and all damage back to the entire party, often instantly killing them. If you're not up to the task for whatever reason, you can transfer your slave status over to another party member by simply running into them. It should also be noted that any non-slave teammates can still hit the boss no problem, albeit for very minimal damage. You can use this to your advantage to push the boss away from the Starkers to make the slave's job easier. I should also mention that if you're the slave for too long of a period, you will take a massive amount of damage often a one-shot attack. After the first gimmick is dealt with, the boss fight is more or less a pummeling session. He can summon a shadow pillar much like the final boss fight Ozma in Darkseid, but who really cares? Just kill the hell out of him. Room 4 is an interesting room that requires patience more than anything. The boss cannot be damaged at all by player attacks, except OPS which is Second Awakening, but anyway. Instead, you deal a set amount of damage to him by completing a simple minigame of stepping into these pillars. Yellow pillars require that you stand in them for a few seconds to disable them, and the red pillars will be disabled as soon as two players are standing inside of them at the same time. If there are no pillars on the map by the time Numak attempts a large channeling attack, then he instead takes a large amount of damage. Conversely, if there are pillars, you take the damage and the process repeats. Two times throughout the fight, at the beginning and near the end, he will summon evil clones of himself. They must be defeated to continue to step on the platforms, because while they are alive, the boss will attempt to attack you with the pillars after a certain amount 
amount of them are summoned. Just kill them and continue the gimmick of stepping on the pillars as normal. Like I said, this room requires patience, and while the easiest to explain, it'll probably take you the most time out of all of these rooms. Warning, do not CC the boss or knock him down. And actually, let me explain why right now. Room 5 features a boss that is much like the boss of Room 2. There's a certain way to go about killing him, and if you don't know, you're just gonna annoy your team. If the boss is CC'd, either by freezing him with something or stunning him, he flat out gets invincibility during the duration of that CC. It's pointless to try. Knocking him down, much like the boss of Room 2, will also grant him invincibility for about a second, rendering that tactic pretty annoying as well. Keep him standing while you do damage to him. One other thing to mention is this guy is weird. I can't really put my finger on it, but he's also resistant to severe hit stun. I mean, check this ghost orb out. This thing usually hits like this, but against this guy, it's hitting more like this. So just be mindful of that if you can't seem to blast this guy as hard as you normally can. Now to talk about pretty much his primary gimmick that he'll probably use multiple times throughout the fight. Periodically, the boss will gain iframe as he channels a massive flamethrower attack that will almost certainly wipe the room. The only way to avoid the attack is to carry a blue ice aura back to the boss given to a party member that is standing in this pentacle. That single member has to run back to the boss, but very frequently they will be frozen in place, basically meaning you have to inch your way to the boss and keep running. There are giant rocks that fall from the sky to block your path, and if one lands directly on top of you, you'll be stuck unable to move at all until the rock times out. One thing that other teammates can do to help out is use a move that has a vacuum effect on it. Even if it's not for damage, it can be used to move the boss closer to where the ice carrying member is to make their job easier. After that, the boss is pretty straightforward. The last thing I'll note is that if this boss is knocked down or hit stunned during the time he is slated to do his flamethrower attack, he won't do the attack. Because of this, oftentimes parties may find it useful to knock the boss down on purpose, even if it gives him iframe. For instance, right at the start of the fight when he often does his first iteration of the flamethrower attack. Now, much like the case with this entire dungeon, this boss fight is also straightforward. Bacall is on the far side of the room, but give him a few seconds to fight you in his final form. Frieza, eat your heart out. At least this asshole doesn't take 50 episodes to do it. Immediately once he does, however, he is targetable. But one minor detail that some classes might not even be aware of is that Bacall can only really be damaged by damaging his head. While he's crouched down in this state, any class can just wail on him, no problem. So make sure you're doing that at all times. But when Bacall is standing up in this state doing swiping attacks and such, he can often be untargetable by some classes. My female striker, for instance, has some serious trouble hitting that asshole when he's doing that. Just be mindful of that and you should be fine. A common strategy most parties use is to attempt to kill the boss right there at the very beginning. Just try to damage him to the max and chain all kinds of CC like junk spin and the like to dispatch him quickly. If that doesn't work out or you just don't have the deeps, then here are some gimmick attacks Bacall likes to perform afterwards. Probably his most memorable attack is the DDR Shuffle, performed once he hits a certain amount of HP. It's hard to say, but I don't think this gimmick attack can be skipped, because if you don't kill him immediately at the start, this is the move he's almost certainly going to perform. He flies into the background and roars. During this time, your character is stunned, and you're given some obvious DDR prompts that must be pressed with the appropriate timing. You have to do this several times, however, and if you mess up the commands more than two times, you will take some severe damage. One thing to note is that if you miss a key, the following key will always be exactly the same as the one you just missed. Another attack Bacall likes to perform is a Meteor Storm Carpet Bomb, with only a few select patches of ground being safe. I often like to run to the top portion of the map to avoid this attack, as I feel the hurt boxes are a lot more lenient up there. The last attack he can perform while in the air is a flamethrower similar to Young Skaza in the Naissance dungeon. You merely have to stand under him or far away to avoid the attack. Though if you're near the wall, I'd advise not standing underneath him since he can fly off screen still. If you're caught with this attack, you'll be burned, and this damage can conflagrate to other teammates that you touch, so don't punish everyone else for getting hit with it and stay away from them. After performing any of these three gimmick attacks, Bacall will always come slamming down onto either the left or right side of the room, and if he lands on you, it will do significant damage. Because of this, try to stand in the middle of the room to avoid needlessly getting pounced on. When he descends like this, he 
also gives you a pretty good opportunity to damage him with everything that you've got. If you follow these steps, then Pakal the Dragon Lord really is a huge pushover, and that's fine with me. After all this hard work, I could go for an easier boss. And some food. I'm starving. Lizard soup, anyone? But anyway, guys, that marks the last of the Otherverse dungeons and the end of the Masters of the Otherverse series. I'm extremely relieved myself that I finished it, because now there's a comprehensive video series out there for people who might need it. Make sure to send it over to those who are interested. Now I'll be the first to admit that it isn't perfect, and I didn't get everything factually correct, however I'm confident I've got it good enough for anybody to join a party and still be successful. I'm glad of all the people that it's helped, and even if it hasn't, I hope it's at least been entertaining. But anyway guys, thanks for watching. And I will catch you knights oh, later. later.